My name is Shara Prescott. I'm the executive director here at Black Creek Community Health Center. Um, and we're really pleased to have been able to organize this information session for the community. Um, we are pleased to have some of our, not only our community residents here in attendance, um, our community ambassadors who are members of the community or some of our staff, um, including our community outreach workers um, uh, and other members of our interdisciplinary team. Also staff of our, some of our uh, partner agencies um, who, that we've been collaborating with really closely over the last few months, more so than we have been in the last 30 years. Um, just so really wanted to extend a warm welcome to you all, including our speakers who um, have agreed to uh, provide us with some information and answer the questions from the community tonight. Um, on this slide, you'll see the um, agenda for the evening. So how this will work is that we will, each speaker will be giving, given an opportunity to say a few words um, and share some slides of information with you, with it, with you all. We'll pause at, after each speaker to give you a chance, to give us a chance to see if there are any comments or questions in the chat. However, we, if you can save your questions until the, um, all the speakers have gone, perhaps some of the speakers might answer the questions you have. So we will have some time for questions and answers after each speaker um, does their presentation. So again, um, just wanted to, want to welcome everyone to this session. My name is Cheryl Prescott. For those of you who don't know me, um, the executive director of Black Creek Community Health Center. And um, just a few words about why. Why are we doing this session? So as, as a community health center, it is our, um, we, we provide services to the community, but we also engage with the community so that they can, they are the ones who help to inform our service delivery. And this is a time, as you all know, the last nine months or so, as we, the world and this community has been grappling with, with the pandemic, we, it has been crucial for us to engage with our community. So one of the first things we did as we were um, responding to the COVID crisis is we engaged with community members. We, with community outreach workers and community um, residents as community ambassadors and influencers on the ground so that because we knew that they knew and understood the community um, more so than we did so we re and this is a time especially now as we look towards the vaccinations that were approved in Canada and we look to rolling out these um, vaccines in the community, it's so important that we understand what the issues are, what the concerns and fears um, are within the community. So this session was really designed to provide that information and engage in a two-way um, dialogue. You know, let's hear from the community, but let's it also inform and build capacity among people who actually live in this community. So I think it's just, it's time. I think we've um, admitted most of the folks who have been waiting. So just wanted to start the, the session um, the right way by doing a land acknowledgement and recognition of people of African descent. So as we come together this evening for this important community gathering, even though it's virtual, I'd like to recognize our history and acknowledge the land on which we're meeting. I would like to start by honoring the land that we are on which we are on tonight, which I am. I am on the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishwabe, the Kwa, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River First Nations. Today, Ontario remains home to many indigenous nations from across Turtle Island, including the Inuit and the Métis. While we are aware of broken pro promises, we are all treaty people. Many have come here as settlers, some have, as immigrants and are newcomers in this generation or generations past. And also in addition, in this, the international decade of the people of African descent, I would also like to acknowledge the people of African origin and descent that were brought here as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. 
It is this history and some ongoing experiences of, and mis of mistreatment of certain groups of people in our society, even today, that brings us to engage oftentimes in some difficult conversations, but we must do these, we must do this and engage in these conversations in order to build the trust and confidence in our system that has led to some unequal health outcomes for some. Some of, we, we know of the disproportionate and unequal impact that the COVID virus has had on this community here in Black Creek. So it's so important that we recognize why we're here, how we have gotten here, and why we do have to do some work in building the trust in our communities as we provide care. So let's get started. Um, our speakers tonight will um, share some information about the vaccine. Our community, folks from the community will share some, what they're doing and what they're learning from the community members um, so that we can also plan the the rollout and the distribution of the vaccines in a way that's effective and reflective of the communities that we're serving. So before we introduce our first speaker, we'd, also, we'd like to do a, a poll. We'd like to see exactly, let's, let's have a, 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 a check the temperature, I guess, of what's happening. Does it say something about... So I will ask Michelle, who's supporting this, to launch the poll. And the question we'd like to pose is, if you're offered the COVID vaccine right now, will you take it? Responses are coming in really quickly. That's great. Yeah. Um, so we're just at um, more than about 75% of respondents, 65 We'll just give it another minute. So uh, if you were offered the COVID-19 vaccine right now, will you take it? Okay, I'm just gonna give people a chance so, to answer. So yes, no, or unsure at this time. We'll give it another 15. Okay. And I think we'll stop the poll now. We're gonna okay. end the poll and we're going to share the results. Right now, it looks about 55% of the people that are attending and able to participate that they would take the vaccine. 24 said no, and 21% said they're unsure. I think they're looking for some information. Great that you're here tonight. Thank you, Michelle. And um, I'll be stopping uh, my, sharing my screen in a minute. But just wanted to reiterate for those that have joined a bit later and might have missed it. But so our agenda here is that we we will be introducing each speaker um, in turn, uh, and after each speaker, we'll have a chance to uh, we'll pause to see if there are any questions that were put in the chat. Um, however, we won't be taking any audio questions until the very end. So if you do have a question or a comment, please put it in the chat. We have some of our staff monitoring the chat and we'll be able to engage in that way. So, um, and there is a question and answer period dedicated to those of you on this call, on this video conference tonight. So um, we'll get started with our first speakers who are, um, Dana McIntosh and Francis Pinnell. Just wanted to say a few words about Dana. Um, who is, Dana McIntosh is one of our community ambassadors um, and she has been involved in the COVID response since we began testing in the community early this summer, or last summer. Dana was born and raised in the Jane Finch community and has a history of volunteering and giving back to her community. Along with her mom, Dana plays a lead role um, as part of the Shoreham Animators and runs an after-school program, among other things. Dana is a personal support worker and works in one of our local schools. And the, just to let you know that the bios of our speakers will be posted in the chat as well for you to have a read. Um, and secondly, we'll have hear from Frances Pinnell, who works as an outreach worker in our harm reduction program here at Black Creek Community Health Center. Prior to joining Black Creek, Francis was involved in our Healthy Kids Community Challenge. Um, and during a, a, this time, Francis used his skills as a musician to develop a popular song um, to encourage kids to eat their fruits and veggies. Francis is a native of the Caribbean island of St. Lucia, 
where he worked in the hospitality industry. And as a newcomer to Canada, Francis is aware of the numerous challenges facing others in the community in similar circumstances. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Francis and Dana to share some words about their involvement in the community so far. Francis, Dana. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So I am a community ambassador for the Black Creek Community Health Center. I've been doing outreach from the start of COVID-19 in my community where I live in the Shoreham Court in the Jane and Finch area. My role is really important as I'm able to connect with people in my community with much needed support and services. I also have the trust and relationship that allows my community residents to come to me for support, not only in person, but WhatsApp and Instagram as well. I love to educate my neighbors on testing COVID-19 and the vaccine. This issue really hit home after seeing my neighbor who I was isolated and died of COVID. This was difficult for our community because we are close knit. Thank you, Dana. Francis, I think you have to go off mute. Good evening, everyone. My name is Francis Pinnell. Uh, I'm just going to add a little to what Ms. Prescott said about myself. I am an outreach worker and I deal with people living with addictions and mental health issues. And I feel they are less fortunate and they are the least met by the mainstream services. And the people that I work with, unfortunately, their voices are not heard. So today I stand there on this platform to be a voice for the unheard masses. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And um, we really wanted to ensure that the voices of the community were at the front and for the foreground of this conversation. Um, and next, uh, we would really, again, we are so fortunate to have our guest speakers, uh, some other guest speakers join us. Dr. Matthew Kamwa, Dr. Um, uh, Lamptey from uh, the Tro uh, Toronto Public Health and Dr. Jerome Liu from Black Creek Community Health Center. So our first speaker who will be offering a global perspective of the uh, COVID pandemic is Dr. Matthew Kamwa, who is a senior global uh, health consultant with the World Health Organization. Dr. Kamwa holds a Doctor of Medicine degree, a WHO Certificate in Epidemiology, and a postgraduate degree in Public Health and Community Health. Um, again, Dr. Kamwa's um, uh, full bio will be posted in the chat for you to read. And um, just wanted to say that Dr. Kamwa brings over 40 years of leadership in communicable disease control in health policy and strategy development, healthcare systems reform and restructuring, and management of health services and programs. And I'm extremely privileged to welcome Dr. Kamwa to provide his perspectives on the current COVID-19 pandemic and the role of vaccinations in local and global responses. Turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon to everyone so um, i will i would like uh, once again to to thank the chair for inviting me to this important uh, uh, gathering i will not call it a meeting and um, what is striking right at the beginning is to uh, emphasis on the role of community in any healthcare setting. And in fact, we, sh should, we should expand it to any provision of healthcare, wherever, uh, whatever level uh, it can be. So the community is really the foundation of successful uh, delivery of uh, healthcare. So I will. Um, Next slide, please. So I will take you shortly just to one, uh, say a few words on where we are, where we stand. Yesterday, 
because the numbers have, uh, keep on changing and they have changed also uh, today. So yesterday we had, uh, in terms of uh, COVID uh, cases globally in everywhere, and uh, of course the, those cases are reported uh, to, to WHO. So you can see on the screen that we have, uh, uh, I mean, I say we have a lot, it's close to 100 uh, million people million. Who are affected. And the number of deaths is also high. Uh, yesterday was uh, 2 million. And, and uh, uh, but uh, this morning, or not this morning, early this evening, it was um, a bit higher, that uh, two, two million, 200 and uh, two, two, uh, 2,097 cases. So that is a lot and it, uh, the, it, the number ch ch uh, change almost uh, every, I would say every hour. Next please. So it's, in, it's important to, right at the beginning to lay, I, mean, I would say the ground for, for that because it's an outbreak which is not, uh, which is not similar to any previous outbreak. And, un, and luckily we don't have, we didn't have all the tools at the beginning because we didn't know, nobody knew about it. So, and on top of it, we also have some challenges in many countries, again, at global level. So we have, a, we have some countries who have a, the so-called double outbreak. Yeah. So we have a, a COVID-19, but we have Ebola, for instance. That's a case in Africa, which was really worrisome, uh, difficult to, to address. But finally, I mean, by bringing uh, experts together, uh, we succeeded in addressing uh, in addressing those two, I would say, uh, uh, critical outbreaks. Because for uh, <laughs> Ebola, as you know, it has been affecting many many tropical countries. But uh, until uh, three years ago, we didn't have any any tool. So it's a uh, it's a vaccine, which was used as a candidate. A candidate, meaning that it was not, we were not yet at the end of the, of the test. It was used as a candidate to help uh, millions of people in West Africa. So, um, in addition, we have the staff, the so called uh, staff fatigue, and be, beyond that, we have burnout. And this is uh, due to the, the fact that nobody was, as I put it earlier, nobody was prepared to respond to that to the outbreak or pandemic, but we nobody again, in terms of government, knew anything about uh, 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 incoming outbreak. So it, 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 I would say it came as a surprise at the wrong time and uh, created a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, some countries at some point, if at take the, the last year as the, or the beginning of last year or March last year as a starting point, many countries just decided to close their borders. That I don't want my neighbor to cross the, the border. I don't, I don't want any plane to land here. I don't want this, I don't want that. But nothing positive that I'm offering this or that as it used to be or supposed to be the case. So he, he went, it was very difficult for all the, the so-called developing countries. They didn't have much in terms of knowledge, in terms of equipment, in terms of financial resources, in terms of expertise. So the first few months were really uh, extremely difficult. And uh, on the same list, and which is uh, also also very very important, if not critical, is the socio-economic crisis, meaning that people had less mean. I mean, they still, they, they, they don't they are not reached at uh, the, the same level even as we speak. Meaning that in many countries in the world we have a, a, a very 
a very big issue because people don't have the bare minimum to, I wouldn't say to live, even to survive. And again, this uh, giving the, 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 the pandemic. Next slide, please. Yeah, I will. Um, I also spend uh, in my in my in professional life a lot of years, maybe twenty years, uh, working and working on uh, on vaccines and uh, immunization. This is a critical. Uh, uh, this is a critical point because uh, for months we are asking ourselves whether we'll will be able to have a vaccine, and if yes, when. So uh, these days, as we all know, the vaccines, some vaccines are made available. That's just the beginning because there are many others. I mean, in, uh, at WHO level, uh, 50, 50 vaccines candidates are already in the pipeline, but it will take some time to, to have the final uh, 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 product. And uh, we should, I should stress the fact that um, the the our we call it immune system meaning that our natural protection system was not also prepared because that is a new virus it has never appeared anywhere else okay. so um what are the lessons learned is a is a is a long list. So we'll not go through all of them, but it just or we just go. I will go very fast. Is uh, financing because these are additional the need of additional resources. It, it 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 can be a local, or regional, country, continental level. The, the the resources are lacking. We don't have enough to respond adequately to them. We have also, I mean, the, 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 the work, uh, health workforce, which is, I mean, those who are the frontline uh, workers, we don't have enough in many countries, or those who are there are overworked. They are, they are rich, they, they deliver where they cannot perform as, we, as required. In some countries, if in, in many, they, they, they don't have uh, good labs, la, uh, good, uh, good laboratories for timely testing and uh, confirmation of cases. The lack of uh, the consequences is really the, the, sub, the suboptimal delivery of essential services, meaning that some services which are critical are now pushed aside because we don't have the means to conduct those two at the same time in many places. Then it took and it's still taking time to develop all the tools and the training materials because the situation is not stable, it's evolving. This, the, the next one, which is critical, is what we call the risk communication. Because the level of fake news, the level of information is so, is so high that I mean, that is globally is a matter of a big, big concern. And it is also, I mean, I would say delaying the implementation of uh, some critical uh, task. No, the next point is uh, about uh, high infection and mortality rates amongst health workers. Uh, in, I would say globally, so in the developed, um, uh, mid-level or uh, underdeveloped countries, we, we is notice uh, really uh, mortality rate which is high, unbearable, unbearable. People also have, and it's very difficult to uh, to I mean to just to comply to I would say things which are natural, say washing, hand hand hands washing is not something new. We we know about it. Maybe uh, um, uh, having a mask is, is a bit strange, but uh, above all, social distancing, meaning that, uh, uh, I mean, they, they are, I've noticed that uh, in many places they have a kind of misunderstanding. The social distancing is not, uh, it's not my neighbor, it's me. I start with me. 
I don't have to go close to my neighbor. I don't have to open my doors to my neighbor because the risk is high. And um, it is a, a major issue, in, uh, especially in uh, advanced countries, where people think that, OK, I'm free to do this and that. So I should go. If the mall is open, if we are 100 or 1, 2,000, we can enter the mall. We should enter the mall. The doors should be open. And uh, this is creating um, something which is impacting negatively, not only the response in, uh, in developed uh, countries, but also in, uh, in developing countries, because they, they, they copy the example. They look at the, 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 those countries and say, OK, let us do what they are doing. They are doing the same. And so and lastly, it is uh, important to pay attention to, to I mean, the, the younger ones. Uh, we have known, it has been reported some case of incident due to uh, the use of sanitizers because children use it and start playing it and some have had uh, uh, eyes, uh, <clears throat> trauma due to sanitizer. I'm not saying that sanitizer is not good. It's a very good product. It should be used and it should be used with care with, when we have uh, uh, young children uh, with us. I think, Madam Chair, I think it's, um, uh, thank you. The way forward, <clears throat> one, we have, I mean, these are three, uh, I would say, uh, three critical points. Stop the spread of, of, of virus. And no government can, can be able to stop the, <laughs> the spread of virus. It's each of us, each community, it's not the government. Nobody, no government, we can have all the means, the government can have all the means, but we will not be able to achieve that. So, and those, uh, what I've put down is just a short list of what, what to do. It's, uh, again, social distancing and follow uh, transit, uh, I mean, transit uh, measures, which are recommended in all what we use, it can be a taxi, it can be bus, train, etc. When we are moving around, we should bear that in mind that we are also we are not only at risk, but or, but we can take the risk to our neighbors. And uh, I mean, I will stress it again: keep our hands uh, very free. We, some countries have, I mean, many countries have established the system of confinement, but it's not observed as prescribed. Because when you say you are free, you, confinement is free. As if you, you open, you have a big prison, you put people there, you say you are in prison, but the doors are open. So it's something like that. So the confinement by, I mean, by the, according to not the WHO alone, but the, the standards is that, okay, you, when you are confined, if I'm the authority confining you, I have an authority, I have authority on you. So you can be free to move around. And in, in developed countries, for instance, it has been observed that, I mean, confinement is not, uh, it's just a game. So you say, okay, you go and stay home. I mean, yes, I will stay home. But uh, when I, I move around, no authority to notice that I'm, I'm not, uh, the, the vaccine is a is a key is a key tool. As I mentioned to to the audience, uh, I mean I, I work on on the subject for almost twenty years, and based on what we have and based on the process which which is which has been followed, uh, I mean I can attest that the vaccine is safe. What the, the two vaccines we have now, I mean some are on the pipeline in the pipeline is safe. And the, for the time being, the, this, uh, the, 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 those vaccines are the best tool we have against the virus. Because we are fighting, we, are, we have to kill, we have to eliminate the, the, the virus. And, and I mean, a kind of blessing is that the more vaccinated people we have in a given community, the safer the community is based on a critical, I mean, a critical important principle, 
of humanity, that the more people you have, the, the higher the so-called, we call it herd immunity, so that these people, even those who are not yet <laughs> vaccinated, are protected. So, Madam Chair, thank you for, uh, again, thank you for uh, the invitation. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kramo, for your wealth of experience that you've brought to us, not only um, your, your experience at the front lines, I guess, of fighting with vaccines, but just what you've seen in the world, in, in particular in Africa. And I think, to, I don't see any comments in the chat, but just wanted to, um, you know, just talk, stress the importance of one of your messages of it's so important that each one of us plays a role in stopping the spread of this virus. So we are a community and we are each part of that community. And it's so important, no matter what the government tells us to do, it's up to us and it's our choices. So thank you again. And um, Hi, Cheryl. Cheryl, there is a there is a there is a question. OK, in the chat. Um, so how well are the nurse nurses supplied with with PPE, especially in developing countries, and how well are the hospitals staffed? Yes, I've been, um, thank you very much. It's a good question, a practical question. And uh, I mean, at the beginning, it was difficult to have that because of the hospitals. <laughs> Before having the PPE, you have to even uh, proceed with uh, a reconfiguration of the hospital. How, how is it, what's the flow, what's the direction and so on. And at times people don't pay attention to that, even some hospitals in uh, developing or uh, <laughs> advanced countries, they don't pay, they didn't pay enough attention to that. You really have to think how to, uh, how to organize the, the work on, on, the, on the side. It's critical in such a way that through the so-called triage, so you direct those who are who could be sick to uh, some, I mean, a space which is also made available to them. Then the, the other the other staff members can only access uh, uh, those area once they have the protection equipment because all of them cannot have it at the same time, especially in countries which are still struggling with uh, resources. But even in the advanced countries, uh, we, we, I mean, the, the number of uh, reported uh, of, uh, of staff which are infected, infected in the facility is, is, is not uh, going down, is rather increasing. And again, that's the, what we call the, the human being or the <laughs> component. Because even if I give you the PPE set, are sealed. I mean, based on my own experience, we are visiting some facilities. Still, notice that people are not. Uh, they are not serious about it. They are. Pretty, I would say. They, I would say they are playing with it, but it's not. Uh, it's not enough uh, to to have it, but not to use it as recommended. And uh, some gloves. People. I mean, if you have a glove which is uh, torn, so don't. You don't have to keep the, the gloves. You have to change it and get another pair. So I'm just giving this as an example. But that's, that's the, the, the danger. I didn't want to elaborate much on the, I mean, we, the human being component of, uh, of, the, of the, what we did, I would say the joint effort to, go, to, to fight against the virus. But it's, it's critical, it's, I mean, we talked about maybe we, I didn't, I, I was not very specific, but we can talk about the hand, uh, nurses, we can talk about doctors, we can talk about uh, Weber Fanny himself or herself in a, in a, in a healthcare facility. This is a critical uh, role we, 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 we are called to play. Thank you so much for the answer. I know that there is another question in the chat, but I think in, in uh, uh, it may be answered in our next presentation. So I think we'll move on to um, Dr. Liu, Dr. Jerome Liu for um, 
uh, his perspective on, uh, just to give us again, some information about the vaccine um, through some of the commonly heard questions, probably through his clinic. But before we uh, get to, to Jerome, we'll just to give you an idea about uh, where he's coming from. Dr. Liu completed his medical school and family medicine re residency at the University of Toronto. He has worked as a family physician here at Black Creek Community Health Center for the past five years. Um, outside of his clinical work, he also holds the position of clinical adjunct lecturer at the University of Toronto, where he currently teaches medical students. And Jerome uh, is a trusted professional in the Black Creek community, well liked and respected both by his clients and the members of our interprofessional team. And we're really pleased that Jerome had some time to share with us this evening. Over to you, Jerome. Thank you, Cheryl, for the uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for inviting me here. Let me just share um, my slide screen. Can everyone see the, the screen? Yep. Great. Um, so as Cheryl mentioned, I'll be going over some common uh, questions uh, that people have asked. And hopefully, I can answer some questions that might be sitting in your mind. And if not, uh, please feel free to ask them at the end of the talk or at the end of our session when we have a Q&A period. Um, so uh, first, uh, I, I'd like to let you know that I have no conflicts of interest. I have no relationship with any pharmaceutical company. I'm only funded for my work at Black Creek as a family physician as, and as well as um, an educator to medical students at the University of Toronto. Uh, just a quick disclaimer that our knowledge of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, COVID-19 vaccines is constantly changing. So the information you're gonna see in the next slides are um, up to date as of the info I could find online from Toronto Public Health, from the Ontario government and the Canadian government. Um, but of course, even in the last few days, I'm sure information has changed. So just keep that in mind. So what COVID-19 vaccines are available? So uh, currently approved uh, by Health Canada are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. There are several that are pending Health Canada authorization and those include AstraZeneca, uh, a vaccine from Johnson Johnson, and a few others. Uh, the rest of today's talk will focus on the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines because those are the ones that are currently approved and, and the ones that are being offered right now. So let's talk about the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. I'm going to go into a little bit of science here because I know some people have asked how do they work. Um, so if you look at the diagram here, um, this is the novel coronavirus particle, and here is a spike protein, okay, on the outside of the coronavirus. What scientists have done is they've figured out the instructions on how to make the spike protein, and those instructions are called a messenger, MR, messenger RNA, or a short form is mRNA. Uh, they put it in a lipid outer layer, and that create, helps them create the vaccine. So when you get injected with the vaccine, you're not getting injected with the actual coronavirus, you're just getting injected with instructions on how to make the spike protein. The lipid outer layer allows the mRNA instructions to get into the cells of your body. And then the cells of your body use those instructions to actually create the spike protein and express them on the outside of their cell. Once your cells have shown this spike protein, then your immune system will start recognizing it, building a defense, building antibodies. This is important because later on, when you encounter the real corona, novel coronavirus in, in the real world and, and potentially develop COVID-19, it will allow your body to mount a quicker and better uh, defense against it. So that's how this, the, the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, vaccines work. Of course, other vaccines that are coming down the pipeline uh, will likely have other mechanisms. So it would require an update of the slides down the road, but these are, this is how the two that are approved work. So what are the differences between the two? Uh, well, they're actually very similar. As I've just shown, uh, they both use the same mechanism. They're both uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, they have similar effectiveness and they both require two doses. Uh, the Pfizer one, at least 21 days apart and the Moderna one, at least 28 days apart uh, to get the maximum immunity. There are some differences. They have a different indicated age range, which I'll show later. They have some different ingredients and there's different storage and preparation requirements, which uh, are not really, they're only really relevant to public health and vaccination clinics because it has to do with how they're stored and how they're prepared before, uh, before get, uh, providing it to people. 
So will the vaccine protect me against getting COVID-19? Well, uh, from, from the trials that have occurred uh, testing the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, uh, they found that the Pfizer vaccine is 95% effective at preventing COVID-19 symptoms, and the Moderna is 94%. Uh, to, get the, to get the maximum protection, you do have to complete both doses, and usually the maximum protection comes about one or two weeks after the second dose. Uh, a caveat here is uh, just remember that, uh, in, as you probably noticed in the news and, and, and from what you've read, uh, there are new variants to the coronavirus. Uh, there, there's a variant coming out of the United Kingdom. There's a variant coming out of South Africa. And I think I read of one from Brazil as well. Uh, so uh, as far as I know, and like I said, knowledge is always changing. We don't really know how effective these vaccines are to those variants. I you know, read that, the, uh, that they're reasonably effective against the United Kingdom one as well as um, Moderna, I believe, is working on a booster vac uh, shot to give to help against the South African variant. So people are aware of the variants and are working uh, to make sure that uh, you know, our, we can get the vaccines working against those other variants as well. Uh, just a reminder, you will still need to wear your mask, wear, uh, wash your hands, physically distance, and follow public health protocols, because while the vaccine may will help prevent you from getting sick, uh, we don't really uh, have the evidence to support uh, and uh, the 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 um, the notion that it prevents any spread, so you might still be able to spread it to other people, even if you're not feeling sick. So that's why, even if you get the vaccine to protect your friends, your family, your coworkers, your loved ones, please continue uh, to follow public health protocols even after you get the vaccine. So who can get the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine? So for the Pfizer vaccine, it's licensed for 16 years and up. For the Moderna vaccine, it's licensed for 18 years and up. Uh, if you are 12 to 15 years old or, or are pregnant or might become pregnant or are breastfeeding or have a weakened immune system or issues with bleeding or have a bleeding disorder, then you will want to connect, uh, sorry, uh, consult with your healthcare provider to see whether it's safe for you. Uh, another reminder is um, you, will, you may want to delay the COVID-19 vaccine if you've received any other vaccine in the last 14 days, or of course, if you're sick with COVID-19 uh, symptoms, please don't come for your vaccine. So who should not get the Pfizer Moderna vaccines? Well, if you had a first dose of one of those vaccines and you had a severe reaction, then don't get the second one, talk to your healthcare provider. The other contraindication uh, is if you've had a known allergy to any of the vaccine ingredients, then uh, you, will not, you would not wanna get the vaccine and again, talk to your healthcare provider. I have listed the vaccine ingredients here. They are found on the Toronto Public Health website. So please, please, please do not feel like you need to write it down. It'll be in the recording and I've included the link at the bottom where you can find the actual uh, list of the ingredients. If you're really not sure if it's safe for you to take, please talk to your, your family doctor or your healthcare provider. So should I still get the vaccine if I had COVID-19 before? So if you have had COVID-19 and recovered, the vaccination is still recommended. Um, there has been some evidence that suggests that natural immunity from the COVID-19 illness may not last very long. And I have read some reports of individuals getting COVID-19 more than once. Uh, but again, do not come in to get the vaccine until you're recovered and out of self-isolation. So how long does the vaccine protect you against COVID-19? So we are talking about long-term immunity. We don't really know. Remember, clinical trials of these vaccines on humans only started around March 2020, so we will be studying long-term immunity. Um, it is still recommended you get the vaccine to protect you, even though we don't know about long-term immunity. The reason is we have a limited hospital and healthcare system capacity. We have limited ICU beds, hospital beds, emergency department spots. So if the, vac the vaccine will help prevent you from getting significantly sick, and so it will help prevent you from possibly needing hospital admission. Uh, so this question about, do I need a health card to get the vaccine? It's pretty relevant to me in my practice because uh, a significant portion of my, of my practice are uninsured, uh, non-status immigrants here in Canada. And so uh, I'd like to let everyone know that the vaccine is free and accessible to everyone in Ontario. For people without a health card, government issued ID, photo ID, such as driver's license, passport can be used. And the city of Toronto is working on a way to find uh, a way to vaccinate people without a valid ID available. Another big question is when will I get the COVID-19 vaccine? And it's unclear and it's complicated. There's a lot of factors. For example, vaccine supply. If there's less vaccine uh, that we're getting into our country, there's less vaccine to, to give to people. 
Uh, for example, you probably have heard last week Pfizer had to reduce their, um, their normal shipment to Canada down to 80%. Um, and this week we have we are not getting any shipment from Pfizer and next week I believe it's going to be 50% for the next couple of weeks at least. So that of course will delay how we're able to get uh, uh, people the vaccines. And we're also uh, prioritizing uh, people uh, with certain risk factors. So for example, if you're higher risk of significant illness or death like those in long-term care homes, uh, then they have been prioritized with getting the vaccine as well as people who may, who may be higher risk of encountering uh, the, the coronavirus, such as those who work in long-term care homes or the, in the intensive care unit or the emergency departments at hospitals. In general, there are three phases to the provincial roll-up plan here in Ontario. I will not go into the nitty gritty details. There, it's all posted online. There's a website here at the bottom you can go to, but needless to say, we're in phase one and all the phases overlap. Um, and the hope is uh, from what I've read that everyone gets the vaccine by August or September. So what are the side effects of the COVID-19 vaccines? Again, this applies to the two that are approved, the Pfizer and Moderna. So more than 10% of the time, people get pain at the injection site, headache, feeling tired, muscle or joint pain, fevers or chills. If you got the Moderna vaccine, uh, you may get swelling or tenderness under the armpit. One to 10% of the time, redness and swelling at the injection site, nausea and vomiting. Of the time, enlarged lymph nodes and very rarely a serious allergic reaction. Uh, I'd like to remind people that you know, pain at the injection site, redness and swelling at the injection site are, are common uh, side effects, not just like, not just for the COVID-19 vaccine, but for vaccines in general that we give to, uh, to kids and adults, other vaccines that we, that we give in the past and currently. So uh, those are not necessarily uh, uh, concerning side effects. There's something that, that we've seen in other vaccines as well. Um, so are the COVID-19 vaccines safe? Yes, only vaccines that Health Canada determines to be safe and effective are approved for use. Um, they, when, they, when they review the data, they uh, review uh, the trials that have been used to test, um, individual, uh, to test the vaccines in individuals, and they've met the requirements for approval, uh, including safety, and Health Canada is monitoring uh, vaccines. Um, uh, part of the reason why Health Canada has been able to approve these too quickly is because um, Health Canada has, instead of, so in the past, Health Canada usually requires people to submit all their research, all their data at the exact, uh, uh, at once, and then Health Canada reviews it. Uh, but because of the coronavirus pandemic, Health Canada has been able to get the data in real time. So the, the, uh, the companies making the two vaccines have sent Health Canada the data over time. So they're reviewing it as they go along. So it took less time to review all the data and improve it. So that is, has helped speed up things as well. Uh, so for more COVID-19 vaccine info, uh, there's the website for Toronto Public Health, the website for Ontario, the Ontario government and the Canadian government that I've listed here that you can visit on your own and will likely be updated over time as things change. Thank you for your time. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Liu. And I, there are quite a few questions in the chat, so perhaps we can do a few that, are, uh, that were related to um, Jerome's presentation and uh, we'll uh, take about five minutes um, so that we can get uh, Dr. Lamptey's presentation, uh, which may answer some of the other questions that are there. So um, Nadine, Paula, one yep, hour I'm two. here. Um, so let's start with the vaccine specific questions. So of the two approved vaccines, which one would be better for people with chronic health conditions and allergies? Um, and I'll, I'll combine the second question with this. And then the second question is, how does the flu vaccine work differently than these vaccines? Okay. Um, so for chronic conditions, uh, in, in, in many cases, and I would say most cases, it will be safe to receive the uh, vaccine. Um, I did post some caveats, such as if you have a weakened immune system or if you have a bleeding disorder uh, or given your age or if you're pregnant or want to become pregnant. But if, for example, if you have diabetes, if you had high blood pressure, then uh, likely it's safe in yourself. If you're not sure, and I don't want to give blanket advice to everyone who, and because everyone has different health uh, issues are, you know, coming from a different circumstance. What I would say is if there is concern about safety with the vaccine, please check with your, with your family doctor or primary care provider. But in general, for most cases in most chronic conditions, it will be okay. Uh, I think the second question was about the flu vaccine. Um, I didn't know I'd be asked about the flu vaccine. So I didn't like research the flu vaccine specifically for today's talk. What I will say is 
Um, this will work differently because this is the first time that we're globally using the messenger RNA uh, technology. I know a concern with many people for many people is that we're worried it's um, a new technology and is a safe. It's actually not brand new. We didn't just develop it since last March. It's actually been in development for many years uh, towards other, we were planning to use it for other diseases. It just so happened that when the pandemic came around, suddenly there was the motivation and the money to fund research in this technology, but it is not a brand new technology. All right, thank you. Um, I, I know that we will be answering all the questions, but do we have time for another question before moving on to the next speaker, uh, Cheryl? Okay, well, I got one more for you. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned um, people having COVID-19. So how soon after the case is resolved, so how soon after you've had COVID-19 can you receive the vaccine? Um, so my, underst my understanding is that once you've recovered from your symptoms and you're out of self-isolation, then you can get the COVID-19 vaccine. The reason we, we uh, don't advise people to come when they're actively in COVID or have COVID-19 symptoms is basically because we don't want you to potentially spread it to other people at the clinic. Uh, but uh, otherwise, it's safe to get once you're fully recovered and out of self-isolation. Great, thank you so much. And thanks Nadine for, for addressing for those questions. And again, they're all in the chat and we will um, uh, address each of them uh, towards the end. So at this point, I'd like to introduce um, our, uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Nikoshi Lamti, who is the Deputy Officer of Health from Toronto Public Health. Dr. Lamte um, obtained her medical degree at the University of Toronto, as well as degrees in epidemiology and public health management from Yale and a Bachelor of Liber Liberal Arts from Princeton University. Prior to her current role in Toronto, uh, she has held positions as uh, Regional Medical Officer of Health in New Brunswick and Associate Medical Officer of Health at the Sudbury and District Health Unit. So uh, really some broad experience across the province. Dr. Lamte is a public health and preventive medicine physician who is committed to improving health, but population health through clinical care, policy development and systems advocacy. And again, we're really pleased that Dr. Lamte um, uh, accepted our, our invitation while she is very new to her role and um, looking forward to the presentation. Dr. Lamte. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm so uh, happy to be here. And uh, I hope this talk is useful for you. Um, I will maybe move more quickly through some slides because I think there's some overlap with Dr. Lee's presentation so we can have more time for questions. So if we can go to the next uh, slide, um, please. Um, what I wanted to reiterate, um, as many of my colleagues today have said, is that vaccines um, are a safe uh, tool in the many measures we have to try and uh, fight this pandemic. And uh, choosing vaccination is a personal choice. And I firmly believe that people should have the information to be able to make that choice that's right for them. And as a public health specialist, I absolutely believe that vaccines um, are beneficial um, for helping to protect you and the people you care about um, from the risks of COVID-19. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So Dr. Liu touched on this and what I would just reiterate is, you know, this was a question for me. How did we, how did we um, get to approval for these vaccines so quickly? And it wasn't that any regulatory steps were skipped as Dr. Liu mentioned. They tried to process information as it came in rather than all at the end. So information was being reviewed in parallel. And then of course the um, amount of funding that was put uh, to, to fight this global threat really helped accelerate things. We know that money does help move things, as well as taking advantage of the fact that, um, as Dr. Liu said, work on uh, messenger RNA technology had been ongoing for some time. So they took advantage of what had already um, been uh, in development. We can go to the next slide, please. So one of the important things about um, making the personal choice about vaccination is trying to figure out where is the information that I can trust. And there's a lot of information out there. 
Um, and so what I would encourage you to do is to try and find the reliable sources. Many of us have um, deep and long-standing relationships with our healthcare providers. They know you, they know your community, they know your family. So you know that they work in service of you to help uh, keep you healthy, give you the information to make the choices that are best for you. And that's what I think my role is. In fact, every resident of the city of Toronto is technically my patient. It's my job to try and work with others to uh, protect health and promote health. Dr. Liu has gone over this, um, um, this basic science information about how the vaccine um, basically uh, tries to let your immune system be able to recognize the spice, the, the spike protein on the uh, virus so that if you come into contact with the virus, your body will be ready to fight it. We go to the next slide. Um, so these vaccines are highly effective in clinical trials. There was a question in the chat box about whether these had been studied. There have been clinical trials done on these vaccines and they're ongoing. So for example, the um, clinical trial for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine had over 40,000 participants. And uh, I was reading just last week that I think it was for the Moderna product. Um, they are finished enrolling children to be able to make sure that it's safe and effective in children as well. So the information is constantly changing. Um, everyone has a role in this. So there's a lot of work to make sure we have the information we need. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, Dr. Liu uh, covered this. Basically, um, some of the differences in the vaccines are um, the age groups that it's been studied in and um, the time between the doses and when we administer uh, the, the amount of the vaccine that we give. But they're, they're similar as you mentioned in that they take advantage of the same uh, technology of mRNA technology. Next slide. So the other thing that I would point out to you is um, there are the clinical trials that as I mentioned enroll tens of thousands of participants. Um, because the threat of COVID-19 is so grave all around the world, um, we now also have information about millions of people that have been vaccinated with these vaccines. So just as of last week, uh, there's over uh, 50 million doses um, that have been given to people that have actually gone into people's arms. Um, millions in the United States and Canada is also trying to keep up. Uh, as Dr. Lee mentioned, uh, vaccine supply right now is our biggest constraint on being able to immunize as fast as we would like. Next slide, please. So um, one of the things that I think uh, is important to underline is that with such an important um, suite of effort that we're trying to implement to combat this virus, it requires a lot of coordination across many levels of government. So the government of Canada is responsible for approving the vaccines to make sure that they're effective and safe, and then also purchasing them and uh, distributing them to the provinces. And then in, the tr in turn, um, the provinces have to distribute those to the local level, but also determine um, the priority sort of sequence and list of um, who needs to get uh, the vaccine um, in order. Every human life is valuable and important. Some of the work around who goes first doesn't mean that um, who goes second is less important. It reflects um, some of the way the disease is working in terms of who's more likely to get complications and potentially pass away. So as I said, every human life is important. If we want to um, use a limited resource, we wanna direct it to the people who uh, could potentially benefit most. And finally, once the province has, to, has um, distributed to the local level, um, the municipalities and local public health units are have some responsibility for actually administering vaccine. Uh, there are some public clinics that will be run uh, by municipalities, um, but they also uh, will be working with other local agencies um, to, to for them to um, vaccinate their own clients. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, um, Toronto Public Health is very active in trying to make sure that our experience in uh, immunizing and immunizing large groups of people is shared with all the other agencies that would be immunizing their clients. It's very different uh, immunizing someone um, in an office who's you know, coming in to see their healthcare provider maybe for other reasons and then immunizing them versus trying to immunize large groups of people all at once in a pandemic where we have to think about infection prevention and control. So, um, 
the city of Toronto does have a task force to help organize the clinics that would be run uh, by the city and Toronto Public Health is working with many other organizations um, so that they're ready when vaccine is available uh, to be able to immunize uh, their populations. Um, Toronto Public Health has a role in promoting health in terms of giving people the information they need to make decisions. So uh, a big part of the work right now is also making sure that there's communication materials, things like fact sheets um, and training materials so that when vaccine arrives in sufficient quantity, we're gonna be ready to go. Next slide, please. So as Dr. Lee mentioned, we're in phase one um, and uh, there is some overlap uh, between phases. We are kind of at a pause because we're at the mercy of vaccine supply and uh, the Pfizer um, supply um, changes over the next few weeks uh, means that we're not able to move as quickly as we would like to some of the um, other groups, but we can use this time to get ready to go once it does arrive. Next slide. So here's some more detail about um, some of the groups that would be expected to be immunized at various phases. And this is a provincial plan. And so uh, at the local level in public health, we would be helping all these other agencies uh, be able to immunize um, these populations. So that means that there's going to have to be more than one kind of model of how people get immunized. Not everyone can go to a big central location to get immunized. And so um, agencies who know their communities are gonna have to think about um, how we get to some of the people that are harder to reach. Um, and that's why there's been some pilots, for example, of reaching people in shelters um, and plans for reaching uh, other, other populations, um, as I said, that might not be able to go to a central clinic. Next slide, please. So this is just uh, more detail that you can read on the provincial website. The, the link is in, is in my slides. If we go to the next slide. Um, I think what I would conclude is um, the pandemic has been challenging um, for everybody. And however, this is not the time to give up. This is not the time to relax or, or let go of all the good work that we've done to get us to this stage. And that is because um, the vaccine is just on the horizon. Um, as Dr. Liu mentioned, there is concern about variants that potentially can spread more quickly. And um, until we get enough of us immunized, uh, the virus is still a threat. So um, the last piece I would say is, uh, as Dr. Liu mentioned, it takes uh, a few weeks after you reach your second dose to get the full benefit of the vaccine. And we also don't still have evidence about whether or not you could potentially still pass it on to others. So all these measures that you've heard about many times, stay as home as much as possible, keep your distance, wear your mask, wash your hands often, they're still important. And if we continue to do this together, I'm optimistic we will get through this. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lamptey, for your presentation. And I recognize that there was some overlap uh, amongst this, the different presentations, but I think that's all good because the more we hear information, the more it sticks. So I think uh, it's important that we, we keep uh, hearing the consistent messaging because as, as I think was said earlier, um, there's lots of misinformation out there. And I think we just need to counter that with, 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 with facts. And this is what we heard this evening. So I will now uh, ask one of our folks who's met, monitoring the chat, to go back to some of the questions um, so that we can um, uh, get some answers to, from folks as well as, and then we will hear from Dana and um, Francis again, you know, just to give us an idea of what they're hearing out on the ground, out at the front lines. So um, Nadine, Paula, if you can maybe. Carol, um, there, were, there were quite a few questions. Um, some maybe we'll leave to the end for the, people to um, ask it themselves as, as we might have had a little bit of confusion, but there were a few questions about the second dose and the effectiveness of the second dose. Um, I don't know who would be best to address this, but how effective is the second dose 
And with the delay in the second dose, how how does that bring the effectiveness down, essentially? Maybe Jerome could answer that one. So the, the effectiveness uh, figures, the 95%, the 94% that you've heard is based on having uh, both doses taken. So not just after one dose, because I think, I don't know the exact numbers, but I've I think I've read like 50% that uh, after the first dose and then 95, 94% uh, after the second dose. Um, so you do need the second dose and you need, and you, and you won't get that 95, 94% uh, effectiveness till two weeks after the second dose. Now with regards to um, a delay, I, so the reason why the provincial government has thought about uh, delaying uh, for several weeks the second dose is so that more people get the first dose in. Uh, but because there's limited supply, so if more people get the first dose in, then there's less people, there's less doses available to give right at the 21 day mark or the 28 day mark. These vaccines were studied based on, you know, getting them 21 days apart for Pfizer or 28 days apart for um, Moderna. But I, I think mo I think in the, in the scientific community, the, the understanding is you likely get a pretty good uh, response with ha even if you have it delayed. I know, so I'm not talking about these vaccines, but I know for other vaccines, for example, like hepatitis B vaccines, uh, you know, they're given at zero, uh, sorry, at the beginning, then one month later, then six months later. And even if you're late by a year, we still give you the third dose kind of thing, expecting reasonable immunity. So I'm not, I don't know if that applies here. And I don't know if Dr. Lamptey or Dr. Kamwa, you have any information about that, but uh, I don't think it's been specifically studied larger time periods, but I don't think you should, I, I think, uh, if you're late for the second dose, still get it because you're definitely not going to get uh, as good protection with just one dose. You should definitely get the second one because it can only help. I, I would agree with Dr. Liu and just add that the clinical trials did include participants receiving the vaccine up until 42 days. So um, there were people who contributed to that estimate of it being effective at 95% who, who had up to 42 days uh, between their first and second dose. Dr. Kamwa, did you have anything to add? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, oh you're on mute. <laughs> this is the phrase of, our, of this pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'm, I was saying that, um, I mean, it's, uh, my predecessor have already mentioned what is, um, I say, what is the the facts, what, what is, is the main fact. Number two is that um, we are, it's not the normal, I would say it's a normal sequence or normal organization put in place to deliver a vaccine. We are, we are in a, I would say, very huge emergency and we have to make sure that, uh, I mean, as much as possible, people are, protected. So otherwise we could have waited, I mean, give some time to time, because for some vaccines, we, we, we took months just to roll out the vaccine, but we can't wait for the, with uh, this uh, pandemic. That's why, they, I mean, there's a perception which is right, that, okay, we are running, you know, a bit too fast or the, the countries or the government or the authorities are running a bit too fast. We, I mean, they, those authorities are under, I mean, all of us, we are under pressure to make things uh, uh, happen. Again, uh, bear in mind, I, I think I did mention Ebola vaccine. Uh, people were dying in, in, in terms of hundreds in thousands in West Africa. For, and we say, okay, this, uh, I would say the candidate vaccine, can, uh, candidate vaccine in the pipeline. We're far away to, so you have to convene experts to come together and say, review the, what is available and define the way forward. And then there was an agreement, a consensus that, okay, though we have not even exhausted the trial, what we have as information reliable information can be used to administer vaccine. And by doing so, millions, I would say million, thousands of lives were saved. So it is important to, to not, I mean, know that, okay, when the situation is uh, evolving, 
things will be also uh, be readapted to readjusted to to meet uh, i would say the prescribed standards okay. okay thank you for the collective response to that question and again uh, i think it's 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 clear to us that we are in a very in a dire emergency state this is something that's unprecedented it hasn't we haven't experienced this in our lifetime and we are i think uh, in terms of the the swiftness of how these vaccines were um, developed i think that that's one of the questions i think we, i saw um it's been coming up i think we also have to remember and i think it was mentioned here that uh resources were allocated to this more so than any time in history not only resources but i think that the the one year that it or less than one year it took to develop the vaccines um i think we might have to that's maybe equivalent to 10 years or 20 years um many years ago simply because technology is is better very quickly this virus was was sequenced um you know the scientists were just out there just running this race um again to protect the you know the citizens of the world so there's there is a lot that's different here and um again the decisions this has been a very difficult leadership <laughs> um uh, place to be in to to find the right um, way forward so again thank you for for this information we will be posting as much as possible um some of the questions we're see i'm seeing some of the questions that are very specific that um we will gather some of these questions and and get back to folks we, we do have your contact information from uh, the the registration, um, but just uh, also wondering if at this point I could call again on um, Dana and Francis just to give us an idea of as you do your work out on the in, in the community, what are some of the things you're hearing? What are the fears, the concerns, and the questions um, that you're hearing out there? So I have two questions here, Cheryl, that the community is really concerned about. I don't know if any of the doctors can answer the questions, but from two of the questions, one says um, the vaccine both um, have a microchip that are being put into people's arms to keep track of them. And the other one is it's here, both vaccines are here to kill people of color in low income areas. Okay. Anyone wanna tackle that one? Those? Dr. Kamwa? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, I'm, ju I'm just I'm amazed, I'm surprised. And um, this happened in the in the past. We have this even in normal circumstances where we've we are we had maybe measles outbreak in some region, uh, cerebrospinal meningitis. People, I mean, it's not common in this part of the world. Um, we are exploring the the the, the way to develop the the vaccines again against malaria to protect millions of people who are affected and even millions who are dying every every year from malaria so uh, the community reaction is uh, is i would say here is similar to what we we notice in the different places in the world so but our role is to of course based on evidence which is provided uh, to take the time, because it, it cannot be imposed upon people. It's really to have open a, a space for dialogue and provide the right information. If not, because it will be escalating, it will be becoming bigger and bigger, and people would say, "Okay, we don't, we don't, we don't buy into it. We don't accept this uh, or, or, or that." Um, again, those vaccines were. The vaccines which are now uh, being used, I mean, we went through a channel. I mean, I would say high speed, a channel to get to be available now. Otherwise, as uh, Dr. Jerome mentioned, uh, for many vaccines it took uh, <laughs> years, not months, years and years to to go to the end and say, okay, this is the final uh, product. And uh, lastly, I, I heard, I mean, just link because people has uh, uh, received that question, uh, not here, but uh, elsewhere. It's about uh, why, why they're talking about uh, variants. So, uh, variant. so what are we going to do? 
I mean, my simple, the simple, the best way or the simple way is just to say, okay, think about uh, flu, seasonal flu. So every year we have to adapt the, the vaccine because one cannot work for long because the virus is changing. So we have to change almost every year. Just, I mean, just to provide that, I mean, that piece of information, people will also think twice that, okay, it's, these are products under development. We don't have, we, we may not have answers to everything, but over time we'll know what is, uh, what is, uh, what is on the ground. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for validating the fact that, you know, this is not something new. These aren't new questions and concerns. And I think it speaks to also uh, some of my earlier comments about the fact that there is, there is some la lack of trust uh, as well in the system. And people are worried that this is something, um, as Dana said in her question, that is there to, to harm those people of color, those people living in low income. Uh, again, that differential treatment of certain members of our society. And we have to work hard at, um, you know, building that trust um, and increasing that trust as we go through this process. Um, Francis, can could I, I, I? Yeah. Oh, would you like to? Sorry about that. Maybe I'll, you know, I, I was just going to add that I think I can understand where that question is coming from when we're at a stage when people might not know a lot of people who've been vaccinated yet to know that they've had the vaccine and been okay. And so, you know, as part of this community, I would never recommend something that I didn't think was safe. I can tell you though, that I know people who've been vaccinated uh, and uh, they've been okay. So- um, Sorry to interrupt you, but um, they've been okay, but they haven't been, they've been vaccinated, but it hasn't been proven long enough to, to really say if they've been okay. I would say they've been okay if it's over two years or over a year, even a year giving it but being vaccinated within a few weeks or a few months and saying that they haven't had any, any sort of uh, side effects from it in those is, is saying it's okay. I, to me, that's why the black community is questioning it because there's yeah. not enough research in regards to it being okay. Yeah. I, think you're, I think you're raising a good point and that, that evaluation is continuing to happen. So the, the studies aren't stopping, they're still going. Yeah. I, would, I would just say everything is, uh, with timing, the um, the threat of COVID-19 right now is very real, right? The case numbers are still high. Yeah, and I just wanted to also add that we will be, this is only one of many, many conversations around this. And um, uh, I think for at the end, I was, would mention that there are some uh, other information sessions, one specifically around vaccine hesitancy in the African Canadian community that's happening this Saturday, January 20th. 30th, and we'll be putting it in the, the link in the chat that's um, uh, organized by CAFCAN. Um, and so I think these are conversations, definitely, because you, we, I think no one is saying that we have all of the answers. We are, this is a continuous process that we're all learning collectively um, how to deal with this. So uh, thank you for the question and the comments and, and, and responses. Uh, just in the yeah. interest of time, just wanted to Give Francis a minute. Okay. Uh, excuse me. My point is that uh, I work with indi in individuals who have addiction problem and mental health issues. And most of the people that I work with, they do not have a platform like we have today. They don't have the TV. They don't have the internet. And if I do not go and have a mouth to mouth or word or word with them, how do we get this information across to them? And how do we answer some of the questions? I, I have a few questions here that they, they brought to light to me. One guy said that, okay, he's, he's on hard drugs. He, he's using uh, crack and he's using Percocets. He said that that is enough for him. He said that he is immune to the, vi to the virus, he won't catch it. How do I go about uh, trying to convince him that that's not the right way to go about it and that those drugs are more fatal to his well-being than it helping him to live a better life? Thank you, Francis. 
Does anyone want to take that one? Because the issue, I think the issue is awareness and education. Yeah. That is yeah. the thing. Because our community is, is a mixed community. A lot of people came over here and they still have their culture they brought with them, their beliefs that they brought with them. Even today, I was under this concoction. One gentleman gave me this. It's made of ginger with herbs and the backs of trees and honey in there with garlic. And he said to me, drink this. You don't need no vaccine. So we have, we have all these little, you know, scenarios and we need to educate our people especially people in our little hub because i think we are like i said we are impacted just like everybody else but we are left out sometimes i think we are forgotten out there so it is the onus is on us at black creek here and me and my fellow colleagues to be out there so i'm just asking doctor how do i go about you know getting them to come through the doors so that they could get vaccinated or they could get even first uh, tested to see whether they, they, they are infected or not. Will you be letting us know when vaccine will be available for us at Black Creek? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll take that question and I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, respond to Francis first in that it's not a response to the question other than to say that from the time this um, pandemic started, we know that as a community, we've been responding through the community-based testing that's that's been led um, uh, by the distribution of food and other resources to, to community members, by the hiring of some of the community ambassadors that are here tonight, um, including Dana, Jane, and I see, I see some others. And I think the, the importance is not only to use one mode of communication like Zoom meetings. It's about face some face to face again, communication that is done safely. Again, uh, I think we have to really emphasize that safety piece when we're out there to model the the wearing of masks, the dis social distancing, and the hand washing. Um, so we've been doing much of that as as we went along um, as we've been navigating this pandemic. Um, and I think for the vaccine strategy, I believe that this is something that we have to continue to utilize the same strategies. And, uh, you know, we have tonight, you know, a variety of, of information sources from our own uh, primary care physician here at Black Creek, who will be speaking to our own clients about this from the public health perspective, um, you know, as the rollout, as we know more of the rollout, and from that global perspective around telling us, you know, this has happened before, this, these are the lessons we learned. Um, and I think um, just, I don't want to keep us here too much longer. And there are, were many questions um, and much, a lot of information that was shared, which we will ensure that we, um, we distribute to the community. But most importantly, we will keep in mind these questions and we will have a look at the questions and we will find, we will be, uh, distributing some of the answers to, to those that were registered for this um, this event, but we also will keep the comments in mind as we develop the strategy, the local strategy in particular, because we may not know what happens in another community, but we do know what's happening in this community. And there are some resources, I think uh, we've we're putting up slides here. There's a wealth of information, even though it's been a short time, lots and lots of work has been done around this, this virus and the vaccines that were developed. And please, you know, uh, look, some of them will be posted on our website. Uh, there are on the City of Toronto website, on the Ontario Health website, and our staff and our community members will be, will be working with you to um, help you understand what is, the, the truth and you know and to be also validate some of the fears that are out there and concerns so that we as a community we will be able to stop this spread to um, protect our community uh, it was said here that it's important we each have to do our part and um, we, we each have to do our part and this is not a time for us to be, uh, to unfortunately, to, to be slow at it. This is a race because there are many, the numbers Dr. Campbell quoted earlier about the number of people infected, the number of people have died and the unequal impact this virus has had on this community 
um, on the people who are working very, very hard um, to, to make a living and to survive, to the children that have not been able to be in school to learn, we know that these are things that will impact them even more so than, than in other communities. Um, I know that there are grandparents out there that are just waiting to, to hug their grandchildren. I know that there, there are individuals who are afraid of, of infecting their, their elderly um, uh, parents or grandparents. So I know we are working really hard to get back to that place of normalcy. We have to move from a place of fear to a place of hope. And I think the vaccine affords us that, that hope. And, um, but in order to get there, we have to ensure that as many people as possible are vaccinated to, to afford us that herd immunity to protect um, the community. Uh, there will be individuals who may not and will not um, get that vaccine. However, we have to inform ourselves. Let's ensure that we're making our decision from a place of, 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 of an informed place, uh, a place of knowledge. Um, and on that note, I think we had, um, uh, another poll, actually, to for Michelle, if you, you wanted to just put up a poll as to, based on what you've heard this evening, um, uh, have, have you changed your mind or if you were offered the vaccine, would you take it? Um, for those of you that joined late, we, off, we did this poll at the beginning of the session and we just wanted to, to check the pulse again to see if uh, the numbers change. Um, understanding, of course, that some of, uh, we can't make a, a straight comparison as meant that we might have some new people that are answering the question. We really appreciate, um, appreciate that. And also just to remind you that this is only one of many sessions that we hope to have. Um, we know that different communities have, may have different questions. Um, so we would like to offer um, sessions, uh, maybe targeting different community members, uh, different population groups within, within the Northwest Toronto area. Um, and we, this is about informing and educating and really appreciate um, your presence here. So um, just one, for those of you that are still here, thank you for, for sticking with us. Interestingly enough, our Mr. results of our poll, <laughs> Michelle. I, I have a question, please. Oh, okay, Jen, and just give, just give us one second and I'll, I'll get to your question. Okay, so look, so I, I think that, yeah, go ahead, Cheryl. You can oh, I was just saying that I think in our first poll, we had 55% of those in, uh, that were here that answered the question saying they would take the vaccine. At this point, we have a 1% increment. Uh, so I'm not sure what that means. We'll, we'll have a look. Um, it, it looks about the same, the, the results. So. Not sure what that means, but certainly I hope that the information that we, we provided to folks um, uh, was helpful. Um, and we have one last question, um, just again, to help us with our planning. Uh, what are the topics uh, related to COVID that you would be interested in for upcoming sessions? And if you, again, take some time to answer that. And Janan, I'm sorry for interrupting you. If you can ask your question now, I'll. It's okay. Um, I just, it's a, qu a question for somebody else, but it's uh, such important and important uh, question. But uh, before I ask my question, I would like to thank you for this and thank, uh, big thanks for the doctors and for the uh, information. It's such an uh, amazing and informative session. But there is a question uh, related to those people who, ha who have uh, a health problem, health condition, especially the diabetes. So if we have a person who is diabetic and is uh, allergic to, uh, uh, is not allergic to Tylenol, but he's allergic to penicillin. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, vice versa. He's, not, he's uh, uh, allergic to uh, Tylenol, but not allergic to penicillin. So this person, can, can he get the vaccine and which one is better for him? So we, so this is the question that I've been asked to, uh, to ask in this session. Okay, thank you so much, Janan. And I think that's a question that we will, um, it's a specific, very specific question. And I think as Dr. Lou had said earlier, we're really encouraging uh, individuals to check with their primary care providers if they have one and if they, not, we will research these questions and get back to you um, with them. Please. Okay, we, we, 
we have all of the questions recorded and we, we know who has asked them. So we will endeavor, do our best to uh, reply and respond to everyone. Thank you so much. Because uh, in the chat, I said aspirin, it's penicillin, not aspirin. Sorry about okay. that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so, so much. we have, uh, of, of our question, um, of, of our last poll question, we asked uh, folks which what topics they would like to see, and it looks like the front runner here is a topic on COVID vaccines for people dealing with other health issues such yes. as diabetes, high yes. blood pressure, asthma, COPD, cancer, others, um, as well as COVID vaccine for specific ethnocultural communities such as the African Caribbean community, Latin community, South Asian community, newcomers. COVID vaccines and seniors, um, how are vaccines created and tested? So again, we this was really important for us to, to find out what are the topics that are important um, to members of this community so that we can, again, figure out how we can have um, sessions such as these, but also to Francis's point, uh, one of his last points around how do we get some of this information in different formats, not only through uh, Zoom, where some people may not have access to technology, but you know, in in um, through social media, through um, just face-to-face -face interactions. So I think this is all really important information. And um, uh, again, we couldn't do it all in the time allotted, um, but we really appreciate those of you that were um, uh, that participated this evening. Um, and I think Dana has her hand up and may want to have the last word, which I will give you in, before I thank you all for, I thank the speakers, Dr. Kamwa, Dr. Liu, Dr. Lamte, Dana and Francis. Thank you for taking the time to um, present and share your thoughts with us and your expertise with us tonight. Dana. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. I just had one last question for maybe public health. Maybe they can answer this question. I just wanted to know why is it that the Jane Strip, Jane Street, um, is always the last, always last in getting anything. We were the last in COVID testing, and I'm sure we'll be the last in receiving the vaccination. So can you just answer that for me, please? Thanks. I'm looking at Dr. Lamptey, who has just joined the Toronto Public Health, and, uh, um, and but I think you know if the question can't be answered, uh, certainly uh, the sentiment is um, is there, and we know that from what we hear from our clients and our community members as well. No, I, I understand completely where she's coming from. What I would say is, as Dr. Um, Kamwa said, the community is at the center of the success of any healthcare intervention. So I hear what you're saying. I understand it. And um, it's something that I'll make sure uh, that Toronto Public Health is aware of. And what I would say is, as I said, every life is valuable. So we're going to have to make sure that where um, vaccine um, is needed because of higher rates of COVID infection and higher rates of complications, that those parts of the city make sure that they get the vaccine um, and that they can be protected. So I hear what you're saying and it's not anybody's intention to um, have anyone felt left out. And we know we're gonna have to do the work to make sure that however we deliver vaccine, that it meets the needs of all the different uh, parts of the city and all the different uh, kinds of people who live in the city. We can't have just one approach. So um, that is very much part of the work that's going on right now is to plan to make sure that when we deliver vaccine, it gets to people who need it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I see, I don't know if some, there's another hand. I, I realize that we are past time and I really appreciate everyone's um, uh, commitment to, to this session, but just so not wanting to be rude, but also wanting to be respectful of everyone's time and knowing that uh, we will plan some of some additional sessions as well as share some of this information. 
I want to, to really emphasize the fact that this is, these are not simple conversations. There are some tough questions out there and let's not minimize the, the reality of, of people who have felt that, you know, you know, there's, they've been mistreated, they, they, they don't trust the, 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 the system, you know, and the, the, these are conspiracies, the, these diseases to, to kill off certain aspects of the community. These are all valid concerns and fears that are being voiced out there. And in community, we have to counteract that. I know that our primary care providers, uh, Jerome included, you know, we, we have to deal with that. And, and it's, it's tough work, but we have to put the, the community's ideas and thoughts into the center of our work and do our best to educate, inform, and have people um, and respect the choices of those that we serve um, and learn from them as well. So I know that uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone will uh, here will agree that we will continue this journey because as I say, we are, we want to get through this. We want to get, um, we want to get past this, this crisis that we're in. So thank you again for joining. Thank um, you. Okay, thank good night, you. everyone. I'd like to say thank you to everybody, uh, including the panel. Um, Cheryl, thank you so very much. This was so informative that, you know, we can take it back into the community and hopefully get people to understand the severity of uh, COVID-19 and get them all vaccinated. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Be safe. I know we're all hopefully at home. The weather's bad out there. Have a great evening. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me on the panel. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Appreciate everyone's contribution. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.